over 75 or so on the call now. Uh, my name is Janet Catterall and I'm the Senior Project Officer for Open Access Australasia. And I just wanted to welcome everybody to this first event of Open Access Week. Uh, three events being run this week by Open Access Australasia. Um, but I am coming to you from Gimoy, which is Cairns in far north Queensland, the country of the Gimoy Wollaburra Yidinji peoples. Very, very glad to be here. Thank you very much for um, coming to support the event. We've got a really exciting uh, panel and there's been a lot of interest in this session. So without further ado, I am going to hand you over to Lyndall Holstein, who's been the chair of the Open Access Australasia OA Planning Committee for 2024. And uh, Lyndall's going to kick off the session. Thanks, Lyndall. Thanks, Janet. Kia ora, everybody. Um, Open Access Australasia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and expend, extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. We also pay our respects to all Indigenous people, wherever they are across the world, including Na Iwi Māori, the Tangata Whenua of Aotearoa, New Zealand. I'm joining you from Wiradjuri country in Wagga today. Um, so, Māori Oho, Māori Tu, Māori Ora, Kia Tato, Homie, Huie, Taikie. Uh, so, no mai, hari mai, kia ora. welcome everyone once more. Just a quick reminder that this session will be recorded and will be available later, free to access on the Open Access Australasia website. So please feel free to turn your cameras off if you prefer that, otherwise leave them on because we love being able to see your faces. We're using a Slido today, so please post your presentations there, uh, sorry, your questions there, not your presentations. And we'll get to them after the panel discussion. In a moment, I'm going to hand over to Dimity Flanagan, who is our chair for today, and um, we'll get started. So as I've said, uh, we are recorded today. We're going to have a series of short presentations followed by a panel discussion and time for audience questions and answers. Uh, let's get going. Dimity, as I've said, is, um, I haven't said this actually, sorry. Dimity is the deputy chair of the Open Access Open Access Australasia Executive Committee. She's the Manager of Scholarly Communications at the University of Melbourne, where she's responsible for open scholarship, copyright and research outputs. Dimity has previously held roles focused on open access in the UK, where she was Scholarly Communications Lead at the British Library and the Repository Manager at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Who knew I'd struggle with English so much? <laughs> Welcome, Dimity. I'm going to hand over to you and be quiet now. <laughs> uh, thank you, Lyndall. Though, did you want to do the opening karaoke? I have. Okay. Sorry, missed. Um, okay. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today for the session Open and Accessible when open isn't enough. Uh, I am joining from the lands of the Wurundjeri people. So we have a great uh, lineup of panelists. Just so you know how the session is going to work, uh, each panelist uh, is going to speak for approximately five to ten minutes, which will give us lots of time for questions at the end. Uh, so please do uh, put those questions in as each of our presenters speak. So the lineup today is we have some great Australian speakers. We have uh, Ash Barber, who is currently the OER Collective Project Officer at CALL, the Council of Australian University Librarians. Uh, she is currently on secondment from her substantive role as academic librarian at the University of South Australia. Uh, we have Mace Fataya, uh, who is the Learning Experience Design Manager at UTS, University of Technology, Sydney. And we have Dr. Adrian Stagg, the Manager of Open Educational Practice for the University of Southern Queensland. However, we're very fortunate to also be joined by some international panelists today. So uh, first up, I would like to introduce uh, our two speakers from the University of Nevada, Reno. We have Teresa Schultz, who is the Scholarly Communications and Social Sciences Librarian there. She supports open access, open education, and other open initiatives on campus and has researched the accessibility of open educational research. Uh, and we have Elena Azakbar, who's the Health Sciences Librarian 
at the University of Nevada. Uh, she is liaison to various health sciences disciplines, provides information literacy instruction and research support to students and faculty in these areas, and is interested in evidence syntheses, data management, and open education. So I'll pass over to Teresa and Alina for our first presentation. All right. Hi, everyone. Let me know if you can't see my screen, but hopefully you should by now. Uh, so again, my name is Teresa Schultz, and um, Elaine and I are going to be talking about a research project, a series of research projects that we undertook, uh, really looking at the accessibility of open educational resources. Uh, and really, this extended over three studies. We're just going to give the highlights. We're not going to go too in deep. Um, one second. If my computer... Now it's just thinking. Well, while it's thinking, maybe, is it going to go? All right, well, why it's thinking? Oh, no, and it just crashed on me. <laughs> it's restarting. I'll just go ahead and give um, an overview. So basically, just kind of uh, some background for everyone. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, Elaine and I, we work at University of Nevada, Reno. It's a fairly large public research university um, in the Western United States. Um, there we go. Okay, now let's try. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Apologies. Um, but the biggest thing to know about us is that sometime back in about 2016, 2017, we actually got sued for accessibility. This is something that's been happening more and more in the United States. I'm not sure if it's in, Austra in Australia. Um, but basically, we were sued for our public-facing online material. It was not accessible at the time. We signed a consent decree. It was a pretty stiff consent decree. My understanding is it actually went further than what the U.S. law requires. Um, but basically, it said that all public-facing online material had to be accessible. Um, also, just generally, as a person who you know advocates for um, open the open ethos, um, you know I, I think we do have a moral imperative to kind of uh, make open inf like access to information you know as as available as possible. And yes, there's financial barriers, but there are other barriers as well that we can't ignore. Um, so basically, this all kind of came together for me and Elena as a question of how do we actually, what does accessibility and especially the lawsuit and the consent decree, what does this mean for our um, efforts to promote open educational resources um, on our campus? When we were first starting our efforts, you know, around this time, the question, the very first question we would always get is, but are OER accessible? Because if they're not accessible, we can't use them. And that's just, you know, kind of how it is. So our very first project, research project that we did, we actually surveyed librarians, and I believe this went out in about 2020, so it was actually just after COVID kind of hit. Um, we tried to survey um, all OER librarians. We actually, it was, it was supposed to be an international survey. Of the 193 librarians who answered the survey, though, the vast majority were from the US. We did actually have three from Australia who took it, so if you guys are listening, thank you. Um, and just some of the highlights from our report, um, essentially, we were kind of asking, you know, how confident do you feel in your knowledge of accessibility? 55% reported being confident. And, you know, this was on a four-step scale of not confident, somewhat confident, confident, and very confident. So confident was kind of this idea of, yes, we're aware of access or accessibility. We have some knowledge of it, but we're not experts. Um, we also found that 47% of our respondents reported that, you know, when they're working with OER, with faculty to find and write OER, they always consider accessibility, which is, which is great. That's what we want. But then there were 44% who said they sometimes do. So that, you know, raises an inter interesting question of, well, you know, how often is sometimes? The, the answer option was just sometimes. So we didn't dive into that. Um, but it does indicate that while accessibility is, you know, playing a big factor in a lot of OER librarians' minds, um, it's not necessarily something that's always playing a factor. Um, we also found that the vast majority of OER librarians do offer some type of accessibility help, uh, but, you know, it, it's usually a little bit more passive and, and not very in-depth help like a LibGuide. Um, there were a few who said they do more in-depth help, like actually remediation of OER that needs accessibility support, uh, but those were definitely few and far between. 
Uh, and then finally, when we asked what were the biggest barriers that, you know, if they were facing to better support accessibility of OER, um, lack of staff and then lack of technical and like ex ex accessibility expertise were, were the two biggest issues mentioned. And now I'm gonna hand it off to Elena. Hi everyone. Um, what we did next is we actually wanted to go and look at the source material, so to speak. So we actually did an assessment of freely available textbook. We got a random sample from um, a repository based in the US. Um, so from all different disciplines of about 355. Um, and we got funding to hire a student to help us go through these books and determine if they were accessible. We didn't go through the entire um, book textbook sample, um, we did about 20 pages or so of each, um, and we had them in different formats. So you can see the numbers listed there. Um, some were HTML files or websites, essentially, PDF, Word docs, and EPUBs. And PDFs by far were the worst to work with, um, and they failed the most. Um, but what we used to assess them is a rubric that we created based on the WCAG standards, which are an international set of standards um, from the World Wide Web Consortium um, for accessibility. And there are three levels, A, AA, and AAA. We mostly had, um, um, our rubric was based on the A and AA levels. And then we had one category from the AAA, which is the highest levels, so the most accessible. Um, and, uh, by, by and large, the books did not do well. They had more fails than passes, with PDFs in particular being the least accessible, as you can imagine. Um, and the top three fails, um, so the, the three categories of that on the rubric that the books failed most of the time with or had the most struggled the most with um, was basically uh, having text alternative for images or having the images marked as decorative if they didn't have a text alternative. So very basic sort of accessibility function. Tables were a big issue um, for authors. Tables were usually not tagged or coded appropriately so that a screen reader, someone using one of a screen reader would understand that they were a table and how to read them. Um, and the other thing that was a big issue um, was just things elements being marked according to their HTML code or tag. So is this italicized, is this underlined, um, you know, is this a heading? So again, things that are built into a lot of the tools we use to create these, these textbooks. Okay. Next slide, Teresa. And having done that and found, finding so many of the books doing so poorly at, with accessibility or struggling with them, we did have a sample of books who actually, uh, whose authors actually did a really great job. They passed most of the rubric elements. Um, and so we thought it would be interesting to do a follow-up study where we contacted the authors of the most successful and most accessible books in our sample and basically had conversations with them over Zoom about why they were able to make their books so accessible. Um, some were actually really su surprised that their books were accessible and that we were contacting them. Um, and it was very interesting. As you can imagine, it's all, this, uh, all the things that um, would help you create a book that is accessible. Um, largely, all of these authors had a lot of support from people at their institutions. So they had big teams, even if there were only two of them co-authoring the book, they would have people at their library um, with, within their IT departments and different parts of their university that would help them work on certain pieces of accessibility when they didn't have the skills themselves. Um, some of them were able to hire students or temporary workers as well. Um, they also discussed how technology and specific tools helped them, but also were frustrating. So several of them relied on a freely available tools and really got to use them a lot and depend on them. Um, but they were very frustrated that there isn't a single tool that would, you know, just tell them whether certain parts of their books were accessible or not. And they sometimes struggled with being able to either afford the tool or find the tool or get the training to use the tool. Um, and then, of course, the usual suspects with any sort of endeavor, um, those who are successful at having an accessible book had sufficient funding from their university or their local government or from a private funder. Um, they had sufficient time to dedicate to writing, not only writing the book, but making sure all elements were accessible. Um, and of course, again, their institution was very supportive or had a mandate to be accessible and to create accessible material. So um, that was kind of built into their project from the beginning. And we have a list of our three studies here, if you want to read further, as well as a um, chapter that we wrote for an open textbook for um, scholarly communication librarians about this topic as well.
Thank you. Thank you uh, both. And it would be great if you could pop those DOIs into the chat because I imagine a lot of our listeners will immediately want to bookmark those to learn more. Um, I'm now going to pass on to our next presenter, Ash Barber. Uh, Ash is a librarian driven by lifelong learning and empowering others through equitable access to information. Uh, as mentioned, she is currently the OER Collective Project Officer at the Council of Australian University Librarians. Um, throughout her career in university libraries, her work has been keenly focused on open education advocacy. Uh, she co-convenes the Asolite uh, Australasian Open Educational Practice Special Interest Group, oep -SIC, and is on the Open Education Conference Board of Directors uh, through a Libraries of the Australian Technology Network Fellowship. She developed Empowered OER, which provides practical tools for embedding equity in OER. And I believe we're about to learn a little bit more about that. So I'll hand over to Ash. Thank you, Jamie. I'll just share my screen. So hi, everyone. Um, I would also just like to um, acknowledge the unceded land that I'm zooming in from today, which is Ghana land, that's Adelaide. Um, and I pay my respects to the Ghana First Nations people, their elders past and present, who are the traditional owners of this land. And I recognise and I'm grateful for the privilege of living here and being given opportunities to learn about traditional Aboriginal knowledges. And that does lead me into what I'd like to talk about today as well. So you heard in my bio that I'm driven by lifelong learning. And the less formal way of saying this is I'm just insatiably curious. <laughs> I want to learn all the things all the time and I want to empower others to do the same. And a huge part of this is creating spaces for unheard voices to rise and share their knowledge too. And I'm really excited to be here chatting with my favorite uh, with my favorite people about my favorite thing, which is open education. And I really believe that this is the vehicle to making this happen. And I'd like to dive into the equity side of open education that's in addition to accessibility. So looking at belonging and voice as opposed to technological access or access measures that cater for disabilities. So as Dimity also mentioned, um, I created Empowered OER, which is a website that builds on the equity rubric for OER evaluation. And uh, this rubric was created by uh, Branchhead, an educator group in North America. And the rubric was designed to guide educators through the process of selecting um, open educational resources, such as open textbooks, uh, with a lens beyond your usual quality indicators. So those things like credibility, accuracy, relevance, et cetera. The, the rubric instead focuses on areas related to how well the resource develops or sustains equity in the classroom or learning environment. And so Empowered OYA expands on this by providing concrete examples of these things done really well in practice and provides ideas for how to embed these concepts in newly created OYA. And wherever I could find examples, there's also an Australian angle on this as well. And so now I've provided you with a solution before I've actually described the problem. <laughs> so I'll do that now because I created Empowered OER because open is not enough. I mean, someone has to reference the title of the session. Um, <laughs> it's not enough for a resource to be free to access, download and adapt. It could be the most wonderful, dynamic, multiple format types, contextualized resource. But if it hasn't been created with an intentional lens of social justice, it's likely missing the mark. And here's why. Some of you may have heard of Dr. Sarah Lambert's three R's, and if you haven't, don't worry, because I'm about to explain them. So Dr. Lambert wrote a paper in 2018 titled Changing Our Discourse, a Distinctive Social Justice Aligned Definition of Open Education. And this work is so foundational to open education today that when I was at the Open Ed 24 conference a couple of weeks ago, the keynote speaker was quoting Dr. Lambert's work in their keynote speech. So in this paper, Dr. Lambert defines open education and OER through a social justice lens, and she says, open education is the development of free, digitally enabled learning materials and experiences, primarily by and for the benefit and, and empowerment of non-privileged learners who may be underrepresented in their education systems or marginalized in their global context. And then she underlines this by stating, the success of social justice aligned programs can be measured not by any particular technical feature or format, but instead by the extent to which they enact redistributive justice, recognitive justice, and or representational justice. And so those are the three R's, <laughs> redistributive, recognitive, and representational. 
So I'll give you the brief, too long, didn't read version of what these are. Um, and you can read more about them in Dr. Lambert's work and or in Empowered OER. Um, and we'll pop some links in the chat for you to explore as well. So redistributive justice, um, this is about access and it leans into principles of universal design for learning. You can think about this as kind of like an economic justice, the cost, availability and accessibility of learning materials. So if you're talking about textbooks, can a student afford the book? If so, is the book available to buy in the format that they need and in time for day one of class? And if they can acquire the book, does it actually adhere to accessibility guidelines? As you can see, this is the R that most people instinctually talk about when they're talking about the benefits of OER, because this is what we're familiar with hearing, right? And so if we turn to recognitive justice, this is where we start to look at belonging and ensuring students see themselves reflected in the course materials and design. This includes assessing the dominant narratives in course materials, seeking perspectives that have fallen through the cracks or perhaps been intentionally excluded. And so it's not enough for a book to simply be openly accessible. It must reject a hegemonic view and actively engage in positive and authentic recognition of diversity. This is where decolonization work comes into the curriculum. And then lastly, representational justice is about raising systemically marginalized voices by removing the gatekeeper who controls narratives. This is where you'll see open pedagogy start to come in and concepts such as authentic and renewable assessments and co-creation of OER where students are encouraged to give their point of view and to discover that their voice, their individual experience is valued. So Dr. Lambert's work on the three R's inspired my original fellowship proposal, which led to the creation of Empowered OER. It was like my eyes were suddenly open to the, sorry, just, I didn't realize there was a pun in there. Um, my eyes are suddenly open <laughs> to this massive blind spot that I had. Um, and I realized that OER without this social justice lens, it's just not doing what, what we need them to do. Um, and we need to dive deeper and do some more work if we're able to achieve the goal of equity in education. And just to tie things up with where I am now working at Call um, in the, the OER Collective, there are almost 50 open texts now that have been published through the collective. And so many of these are big cross-institutional, interstate, international collaborations. And um, so many of these texts as well have been authored by First Nations peoples and people from other systemically marginalized groups. So we're starting to see an increase in the three R's enacted through OER in our region, which is really exciting. And hopefully sessions like this and open at Open Access Week will really continue that momentum going. So um, thank you. And I'll hand back over to Dimini and look forward to the questions later. Thank you, Ash. It's great that we've already had two different, very different perspectives on the topic. Um, and you know, there's a lot of interesting parallels with your 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 talk and your work and the issues with research and open access and the growing prevalence of the pay to publish model. So um, lots of lots of things to think about there. Um, and yes, please keep those questions coming in. Um, our next presenter, Mace Fataya, is an educational technology specialist and advocate for open education. As mentioned, currently the learning learner experience design manager at the University of Technology. Uh, Mace has worked in higher education since 2008, including at the Open University and Western Sydney University. Her expertise includes designing open educational resources, leading transformative learning projects, and creating technology enhanced environments. Uh, Mace earned her PhD in 2016, exploring sustainable OER development models and has led UTS Open Education Weeks in 2023 and 2024. So I'll hand over to you now. Thank you uh, very much. Um, let me share my slides first. Thank you for having me today. And I am very happy to be with everyone here. Uh, I hope you can see my slides. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, so all I'll be talking to you about today is open education. I'll talk about access and accessibility and how we here at UTS how that we joined the open education a little bit later. So I hope we won't fall into um, the challenges from Nevada um, University. Uh, which I suspect we will. But anyway, um, I'll share with you what we have done. Um, so open education, access, accessibility, and beyond. 
Now, the um, how I'm going to present this to you today, I'm going to um, talk to you about my role, the role of my team, how we contributed to open education at UTS. Um, I'll give you some rationale about why um, having a good community around open education um, has contributed to where we're at at UTS. And also I'll share with you some strategies towards the end, which are based on the things that we've done. I'll provide some examples and some references uh, or resources to help maybe someone to hopefully get inspired or replicate what we have done. So um, as a professional staff, um, I identify as a learning designer, learning design specialist, educational specialist, and people who work in the third space, uh, librarians, uh, administrative uh, staff, educational developers, um, and also as we as they are uh, usually in, uh, called in, in uh, the Northern Hemisphere instructional designers, we collaborate and cr create and assist developing teaching material. This is really what we do. Um, oh, did I mention librarians? Of course, our good friends in open education as learning designers. So we are situated in the middle between um, the university management strategies and academic staff. So we create that um, uh, intersection between pedagogy, content, and technology, or as is explained in the TPAC. Now, what do we do actually? We build capacity, we build academics capacity in, um, in different areas. My focus, of course, today is about open education, um, and the uh, the initiative that we took that we took uh, to um, have some significant cont contribution to enhancing students' learning experience as the ultimate goal. So, to for us to go beyond access and accessibility, we really need to think about inclusivity, inclusivity in and open education particularly, they pave the ways for many, many options that can happen from engaging in open education. So as, as open education aims to be the space where diverse um, voices contribute, um, where we make knowledge more accessible, um, it's not just about creating an OER, an open education resource and put it there, but it's also about fostering ongoing dialogue. So we really want to have everyone involved. We want to engage everyone. Adrienne will talk about this, I believe, much more than I will do. But we were inspired by engaging Adrienne Stag in understanding um, how open education is actually everyone's business and how we want everyone to come on board and and uh, contribute. So we want we want to engage um, academics, professional, senior management, community, and as well as industry partners. We want it to make it everyone's business. We want it to um, um, collaborate in honoring um, these um, and, and take leadership and authorship in enhancing educational practice through open education. And uh, we want it to uh, also um, share those um, responsibilities. But what we have noticed that this is not an easy, this comes with a lot of challenges. Um, it, uh, weaving open education in uh, UTS at UTS through the open education through educational practices is not easy. There's a struggle about involving academics. There is uh, a need to uh, address some um, barriers around recognition. There are needs uh, to address the challenges about understanding copyrights and all these uh, things that we have encountered as as professional staff. Um, the answer to 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 these challenges. Uh, it is well documented in literature. So there was a lot about uh, how do we overcome um, uh, these challenges in open education and engage, and engage with faculties and uh, as professional staff work with them and support them. There's a lot of talk about top uh, management endorsement, talk, uh, a lot of talk about how to integrate open education in um, university goals, plans, uh, policies, um, uh, main initiatives. And there is also a lot of talk about grassroots initiatives or make, maybe focusing on the community within. So empowering academics, empowering uh, professional staff who work um, in uh, at that um, bottom level. So what I'll share with you now, um, what we have done 
and our focus, of course, in the grassroots initiatives today, um, I'll share with you five um, uh, strategies or five approaches, I'll say. Uh, I'll talk about access and accessibility, how we kind of started with this even before started talking about open education. Um, not that, that we intended that to happen that way, but this is what we had. As I mentioned, we joined open education a little bit late comparing to other universities here in Australia. And I'll talk about um, uh, approach to um, um, the utilizing open education uh, in sustainability. I'll talk about decolonization, um, academic uh, development and community building. So in each uh, approach, I'll share with you um, some background to this work. I'll share with you uh, an, an example, uh, what we have produced and some key um, uh, champions, let's say, let's call them, who actually drove that work. And uh, some uh, a link uh, on each slide, which will take you to how to do this or how to apply this in your own context. So the first one, of course, is the accessibility, access and accessibility. Um, for this particular initiative, um, it was it was very important for um, us when we moved from a previous learning management system to a new learning management management system to consider a lot of practices. One of them was access and accessibility. So we wanted to ensure that um, the curriculum remains uh, relevant for the contemporary demands. We want to improve learning uh, in, um, learning environments and cater for diverse. Um, group of students. We have uh, at UTS, we have uh, created inclusive practices team uh, who worked on infusing access and accessibility in so many areas. So we have produced uh, inclusive uh, and accessibility um, and access practices collections uh, for academics, which we use through our uh, support as professional staff. Uh, we have um, developed accessibility and inclusion policy and um, uh, talked about how uh, we need to have all subjects um, and, and, and subject material accessible. And uh, we have weaved that into our quality framework that we use to design um, subject or learning management system content. And we also weave that into our guiding principles into and the new learning management system. These are the practical things that we have done. There's, there's, uh, there are links uh, there, but this is, has been summarized in a recent work published in an open textbook um, by uh, Katie Duncan and uh, Rhiannon Hall, uh, working with the students with lived experience. They talked about their experience as inclusive practices team and how their work has um, uh, inspired all these examples that I'm showing you on the slides here. So the next one is sustainability. Now, um, at UTS, we talk about sustainability in so many aspects. When we started talking about open education and promoting for open education, uh, a group of um, sustainability advocates attended these sessions and started to start thinking about what can uh, be done to um, utilize open education practices to weave in sustainability into subjects. So how do we uh, create something uh, that uh, around sustainability that others, other um, uh, academics can, can benefit from? Um, this group uh, led by Christina Burrow, uh, uh, she's a learning designer, also an education portfolio, uh, developed a if you're familiar with Canvas um, learning management system, she developed a module that can be shared across all faculties in the university that weave in um, sustainability into subject material. Academics can contextualize this module into their subject. Um, and of course, this has been put as OER. Uh, but the interesting things about Christina's work is also um, that this this practice uh, promotes um, um, SDG four, the quality education, and SDG um, ten, reduced inequalities. Reusing and sharing these educational or these resources reduces the need to create a new one for, from scratch for each academic or uh, for each subject, which lowers the wasteful production, which also align with SDG uh, twelve. So all these SDGs from uh, the um, uh, sustainability development um, goals. Um, that are internationally known. The third one is around decolonizing curriculum. This is a big one and a very important one. Um, 
This is, I think this is important when we talk about inclusivity, we talk about voices, we when talk about uh, marginalized voices, or we talk about hidden voices and weaving in um, for example, in this in this case, indigenous knowledge and make it making the curriculum more inclusive. Um, uh, Associate Professor um, Amanda White produced an open textbook, and through her through this open textbook, she made sure that she bring that indigenous knowledge into the accounting um, discipline, which was a really interesting thing that well, the way she's uh, she's done it. The last one, uh, which takes us also beyond accessibility, is focusing on academic development. Now, this uh, ECODE, ECODE uh, report came up this year, but this has been a challenge for a while. The report quotes that there is, uh, after the end of um, Office for Learning and Teaching, OLT, in 2016, in Australia, nationally, we didn't have really uh, one place that focuses on high quality teaching and educational research which could where others can benefit from so with, with within this domain within the lack of uh, shared teaching practices at UTS as a team the learning design um, or my team Alex D design team we've produced a collection of resources that um, put academics teaching activities and academics assess or designed assessments into one collection that others can reuse, repurpose, um, adapt into their own context. And the last one is, of course, importantly, the community building. Um, for this one, I think there's a lot to say about community building, but I just want to focus on the motive behind um, the act of sharing and finding um, that intrinsic motive of, um, of acting autonomously and feeling that competency, uh, being connected with others, uh, sharing your intellectual property. Um, these are like the motives behind uh, why people share, uh, particularly if they're sharing uh, um, their IP, their intellectual properties. And this is referenced by Dichi and, um, and Cherokee talked about it and called it the cognitive surplus. If you're familiar with some of the things that I've done, you've probably heard me talking about the cognitive surplus, but I'm not going to talk about this now. I'm just going to say that harnessing and um, crowdsourcing community is actually um, one of the things that we have done at UTS. We've collaborated together with the library. We worked on producing blogs and collections. Uh, we have a community uh, of learning designers where we all, in these areas, we talk about open education or promote open education. So we work at that level together as well. So not only with academics, but also together. And we have just, um, we've hosted Open Education Week for the last two years. So this is what we have done at UTS. This is the, the things that, uh, strategies that we have followed. And these are some of the examples that came out of it. As I mentioned, we're still early, but we are very happy to be part of this. Thank you. Thanks. I know you said UTS were a bit late on this, but wow, have you made up for lost time and then some. That is very, very impressive. Uh, <laughs> And I can't wait to ask you some more questions around how you got that momentum going. Um, our last speaker is Dr. Adrian Stagg, who is the Manager for Open Educational Practice for the University of Southern Queensland. I'm sure he's a name familiar to, to many of you here. Uh, his career has included both public and academic libraries and positions as a learning technologist and e-learning designer. In 2014, he implemented the first OEP Learning and Teaching Grant Scheme in Australia and currently supports open textbook publishing and open pedagogy. His doctoral research focused on the ecology of OEP in Australian higher education to identify the contextual influences within institutions and the sector applied to open education. Adrian led the National OER Advocacy Toolkit Project for the Council of Austral Australasian University Librarians and is a co-founder of the Asalite National Special Interest Group for OEP. His work on, in open education has been recognized with a Holt Advancing Academic Development Award and an AAUT citation for contributions to student learning. Uh, he is the person who seems to live and breathe uh, OERs and OEP. So um, I will now hand over to Dr. Adrian Stack for our, our final presentation. Thank you very much, Dimity, and thank you to everyone who uh, is joining us here today. I'm very pleased that I got the last slot because whenever um, I'm asked to speak on any of these sorts of panels and the like, 
I like to take it as an opportunity to indulge in some deeper thinking around open and to really challenge some of my own thoughts. And so by doing this, I'm, I'm presenting something which is a bit more conceptual than everybody else, uh, but something which I think will challenge us in the way that we are thinking around uh, whether or not open is enough, and also around the generalised theme of whether or not uh, you know we privilege community over commercialisation. Now, I would contend that open alone will never be enough. If we take, um, as I do, an ecological model uh, or perspective on open education, uh, we can examine that really open comes to the fore when it is a part of complex, nuanced interrelationships between the inhabitants of an institution. So by that, I, I have a tendency to mean that um, open is part of a generalised ecology. It does not survive by itself. Hence my assertion that by itself, it is not enough. Within an ecology like a university, open seeks what I would consider a symbiosis, a combinatorial existence with another agent that provides benefit for both parties. So what you need to do is pair it with something else for it to have meaning and for it to have value for a broader community. Now, conversely, we can look at our institutional ecologies and say that there are some things which are not symbiotic, but are instead predatory or even parasitic. Um, and those are the things which we often would see under that commercialization banner. I'll go into that a little bit more. Now, within open, we often um, will uh, come up against existing structures. Existing structures that may not actually privilege open and may not privilege community in the way that we understand it as open practitioners. And we look at these mechanisms as really things that constrain human development. And I say human development very purposefully because the background for a lot of my research has actually been Bronfenbrenner's um, Ecology of Human Development. And I want to read to you his definition because it really plays into how I conceptualize this in that it's the process where a growing person acquires a more extended, differentiated and valid conception of their environment and becomes motivated to, uh, to engage in activities that reveal the properties of, sustain or restructure the environment at levels of similar or greater complexity of formal content. Now, when you understand um, why people get involved in openness, what motivates them to do so? Many practitioners will actually say that it was because of a perceived uh, systemic injustice, an individual scenario where they encountered um, inequity or a lack of access, and they questioned why things are as they are. And eventually they kind of fell into open and found that there was an alignment of their values. And I would suggest that, that the relationships, you know, these people who introduce other people to open, who support, who sustain, who help um, the community to grow and help practitioners, this is incredibly important. Uh, because simply making something open doesn't guarantee anything at all. And I think that the relationship that we're talking about here is the relationship between open and something else that creates value. So, for example, when you combine open licensing with open knowledge, you get potentially greater access. When you combine open resources with, say, user experience design, accessibility and then promotion you get a better student or learner experience potentially when you get a small m mooc a micro open online course and you combine it with assurance of learning you get micro credentialing and when you combine open with authentic assessment we get improved student achievement employability retention progression so when it seeks out that symbiotic relationship within the university, they combine and create something of value. And in each case, they act in a complementary fashion. And that's what we've seen from our speakers this morning, whether it be learning design, whether it be accessibility, whether it be um, lifting up voices that were not privileged in previous traditional systems. 
I would also say that um, to fall back on John Dewey, that we should be looking at education as being designed to encourage creativity, exploration, independence, and cooperative work. And I would question whether or not most of our educational experiences in higher education do fall within those categories. Now, when we combine openness with the idea of education and the student experience, this gives us a lens through which we can create experiences that encourage creativity, exploration, independence, and cooperation. And it also gives us a lens to look at what we, what we can term illegitimate structures. Now, an illegitimate structure is anything which constrains human development. And when we encounter illegitimate structures as open practitioners, I think that, we, that what is demanded of us is for us to turn to these structures and for us to say, justify yourself. In the same way that um, previous philosophers like uh, Mason, Dewey, Bookchin, um, a lot of them being, being the, the pillars of anarchist thought, um, actually look at these existing structures and say, what value do they have to human development? And if the answer is little to none, then we need those illegitimate systems to actually justify themselves. And in doing so, we also expose where previously outmoded ideas continually are perpetuated within higher education, things like models of scarcity. So when we look at a lot of our online ebook providers, a lot of our online journal providers, we are still given licensing models where there are limits on concurrent student access. This is an online resource that in any other situation could be accessed by millions of people at the same time. But we pay for the privilege of having four students in our institution being able to access things like this concurrently. That's madness. When we look at that, that is the, almost the very definition of an Ill illegitimate structure because it is constraining human development by its very existence. And we can turn to these kinds of publishers or other commercial entities, this notion of com community over commercialization. And we can say to them, let's take a look at your structures of scarcity, justify their existence. And I think that as I wrap up today, um, what I want to do is I want to really challenge everybody. I want to challenge you to think about within your institutions, within your communities, even from a values-based perspective, what kinds of things can you actually combine open with in order to get that symbiotic relationship and get that kind of value? And when we combine with other areas of the university, we start to fold people into the notion of open as everyone's business. We bring more people into the community and we start to talk about values. We start to talk about legitimate structures. Secondly, I think confronting those structures as well. How much do we actually do that as open practitioners? Or do we have a tendency to ignore the fact that these exist and we simply get on with our own work? I think that there needs to be a lot more radical activism within open education and within the community. So I'm going to leave you with, um, with a thought from Murray Bookchin, um, who is an ecologist and also a, uh, a very strong um, philosopher in the anarchist um, tradition, where he said that especially of the ecological disasters facing us at the moment, that if we are to accept that humanity is the root cause of the problem that is facing us today, then as a species, we also have to accept that we're the only species with the tools to confront the problem. When we consider that we have enclosed knowledge and that we have provided barriers, these are all things that humanity has put in place. And as such, we're the ones with the tools to dismantle it. So I'm going to leave those provocations with you now and pass over to Dimity. It's always nice when you... Uh... You're listening to someone speak and you can just feel that fire building in you and you want to immediately leave your desk and go uh, talk to someone about it and uh, try and change minds uh, in your institution. Uh, so thank you, Adrian. I'm 
I'm fired up and that's a perfect attitude to go into question time with. So please, as uh, everyone is digesting all the very diverse um, messages throughout um, out the presentations, uh, please put your questions into the chat. Now, uh, Teresa, I know you have to go on the hour, so I might throw uh, the first question to you. And um, this is really a follow up on the presentation. I was interested, you know, with the university having that dissent decree around accessibility. Um, so how much resource had to be put behind that? And, you know, was there a lot of staff having to upskill themselves or was it very much rolled out in a, in a very organized way with, with a lot of training for all the various staff that would contribute to those resources? Uh, I expect the answer on that would probably change depending on who you asked here. <laughs> uh, it was not an easy thing to do. Uh, I can tell you that um, there was kind of, um, there was a whole position and um, and at the time it was under the libraries, but we, um, our office of digital learning for a while was under the libraries. And so there was a whole position hired uh, to help with accessibility. Um, the libraries undertook our own work when it came to our library resources. So if there was something that was part of our collections that wasn't accessible, we had to spend staff time. Um, there was definitely training. Everyone is now required to go through regular accessibility training. Elaine and I have both been through it multiple times. Um, and yeah, it was not an easy thing. It was, it was, I would say it was a big undertaking. It wasn't easy. Um, but honestly, that's kind of when the power of a lawsuit can come in. Cause if you didn't have the power of a lawsuit, who knows if, or when we would have undertaken this fully. Yeah, it's very interesting. I'm not sure I've heard of anything similar in Australia or New Zealand, um, but Great to see that it did have a very positive, positive outcome. Um, and sort of, I guess, following on, there's a, for both, I guess, as a starting point, Teresa and Alina, there's a question um, in the Slido around, you know, there was that comment that one of the, the biggest um, relationships with accessibility was having that support team and all that, um, I guess all the different types of support that might entail staff and funding and how that then makes it a much easier um, idea for more uh, resource rich institutions. Um, how, how would you comment on that with all the interviews that, that you um, undertook? Elena, do you want to handle this one? I'm going to chime in, Teresa, uh, but it's something that was troubling to us just, be, you know, knowing who we were talking to, them having uh, funding in particular, it's, you know, we didn't really know what to make of that, what to like suggest for someone who doesn't have that funding. Um, people did rely though on freer tools as well and um, just their colleagues. So there are workarounds for that as well. Um, and not everything was something that required massive, massive support, like a whole department. Sometimes it was just another colleague in another department who had more skills and was willing to step in. But there is some disparity there. If, yeah. if you know how to make Google Docs or Microsoft Word documents accessible, that's something, it's actually not too hard to do once you know how to do it. Like a lot of that technical work is built into the programs for you, so. Yeah, and I guess there's a, there's a lot of people that, um, who just are expected to know how to use Word, but never have that sort of in-depth training that sometimes the, the onus is really on themselves to go and explore all the features. It, it is true. Until I actually went through accessibility training, I, I like didn't want to make use of the styles or anything. I just thought they were pointless. And now I've come to realize, oh, they're really helpful. And I've just gotten into the habit of any like document I make, like I'm using the headers. I'm trying to make sure I use the headers appropriately. I'm, you know, like making sure I have like, when I link to my tech, like, like have a link somewhere, does the text kind of give it some indication of where the link's going to go and things like that. So once you like know what you're doing and there are really good training work resources out there, um, once you know what you're doing and you kind of build it into your practice, it does become a lot easier. Um, Ash, I don't know if you also want to comment on that idea that large organizations um, seem to be able to to do this better. Smaller institutions with less funding might be might be locked out. Given you know 
so much of your talk is about empowering unheard voices that probably many of which could be in small institutions. Yeah, well, I think um, there is a lot of, um, there are a lot of free resources out there to, to learn and to help you do things. Um, like in terms of accessibility, there's some um, great discussion in the chat at the moment about the ADSET resources. Um, that's an Australian um, set of resources. And um, even things like adding browser plugins, like the Wave tool um, and color contrast checkers. And there was one that I discovered the other day called Silk Tide that I've been testing out that can even um, show you what a screen reader will, will read on the page. Um, so there are tons of free tools and resources out there. So if you're in an institution where you're not getting funding um, or support to do this, you can still do it on your own um, naturally. Not having support means you have to find the time, but um, I think it's a worthy thing to call that time for. Well, that is a lot of wonderful tool suggestions there. I must admit, a few I have not heard of, so um, definitely give myself some homework to go explore those even further. Um, so while we're waiting for some more questions to come into the chat, um, I guess, you know, when we, when we pitched this session, it was very much open and accessible, uh, no specific focus uh, originally on open educational resources. Um, however, Adrian, your your talk was very much on, on that bigger picture of open. And um, I'd be interested in hearing thoughts on, on how all this fits together, you know, the OER space, the open research space, um, I don't, Adrian, do you want to comment? I know you, for you, that the the sort of the boundaries is almost non-existent. Is that right? I'd completely agree. There's, um, I think that the the boundaries, if indeed they do exist, are porous. Um, because when I look at open, it's an irony that we have all these different camps in open. We have open data. We have open science. We have open governance, we have open education, uh, we have open research and open publishing. Um, and often, and I'm just as guilty of this as anybody else, often you kind of pick your specialty. You pick which banner you're going to march under, in my case, open education. Uh, and everything else is kind of adjacent. Um, and I think one of the things that I've been really challenging myself to do recently um, uh, is to look at, well, what are all the other open groups? What have they got to offer? Where Where's the overlap? And when you start to take an institutional view of what you're doing in open more generally, as, as an, an I mean, open practitioner um, defines a, a, a wide range of roles. I look at, you know, what happens when uh, you get together with the folks in the repository space and how do you actually leverage existing structures that then actually allow you to, to share content, to promote content, or even to promote um, what's going on in your university? If you then go to someone, um, maybe maybe areas that are not necessarily the first people to come to mind, I'd even say going to your marketing department within a university and bringing them into the open conversation. Uh, one of the things that, that I also say is that, you know, when you look for these linkages, uh, these symbiotic relationships, uh, I look at open access publishing and OER as being, you know, they're, con they're coterminous because as soon as we, uh, we set a list of readings, so, for example, you know, we we have a list of open access journal articles which we which we have got to support learning outcomes or learning activities. We're setting them for our, our educational purposes, and so they become OER. Um, whereas, if I'm talking to somebody um, who is specifically in the open publishing space, they will look at this as open access publishing open journals. I look at them as potential OER. What we are both agreeing on here is that the knowledge in there should be used to help educate, to help people to learn. And I think that even though we have all these different camps across uh, across the range of, of the, the institution or across the landscape of open, 
we look for those commonalities, look past the words, and actually say all of us start with the word open. We're all interested in the same thing. What happens when we put the pieces together? What kind of opportunities then start to arise? I'm not sure if that answered your question or just created more questions. No, I think it I think it did. And I I had a question for Mace, and I suppose trying to to connect this. Um, so Mace, my question was really around how you know you caught up so well at your institution. Like, how did you get that institutional momentum? What was the specific game changer? And I'd be curious to know, sort of piggybacking off Adrian's comments, was the, the open access research conversation already ahead of the OER conversation? Did they happen quite separately at your institution? Um, so just your thoughts on that would be great. Thank you. Um, they certainly ahead of open education. Um, when we reached out to academics and done some uh, environmental scan about how well uh, the the term open education is known. We found that little no people know about open education, but when it was open access, oh yeah, of course we know what that is, and they can go and explain to you all the tiers and what it means to. And we talk about the struggle and how sometimes it's expensive and how this is open and this whole research conversation. And we've got a lot of support from the library and open research, of course, and open data. Um, but when it comes to open education, it's just um, something totally new. Um, I think our approach uh, in, in terms of advocating to open education uh, took a very um, kind of initiatives. Um, we first, we took the opportunity for existing platforms. So we have a learning design meetup that's been running for a long time. And um, through the, um, these communities that we have people who kind of scratch the surface around open education in particular and OERs, um, they, we could introduce that notation to them. We could kind of bring them closer to us and start creating uh, cascading effects. So people advocate, so it won't be just us talking about open education. So I wanted to spread it across our community, but we started probably well, we started with learning designers. Um, the library was very active in open research and I've done a lot of work there. But when it came to talking about open education and uh, open education and open pedagogy, if we want to be more specific and how do we design um, first learning materials that are open and what it means for uh, academics and then all that barrier about I don't want to deal with a new copyright uh, issues. It's just like too complicated for me. Um, so these were like existing barriers. Um, so um, that's that's mainly it. The, the other thing is um, until now, we don't have open education librarian. Um, we have open education research librarian, but we don't have open education specialist or um, someone who's like whole role dedicated for open education, but we made that happen through our central team. We made that initiative happen and we've produced so many resources and references. But one of the things that we also did is we went into the technologies that academics use a lot. Uh, I mentioned Canvas. Well, Canvas is not like open as you would hope, at, at least in our version uh, at UTS, because, you know, institutions can customize the, the learning management system to suit their purposes. But we focused on the, the tools that very popular academics love to use, and one of them was H5P. And um, H5P is probably many of you familiar uh, with this tool. It also has an open education resources hub, OER hub feature. Um, and before we enabled that, actually, we, in, we before we enabled that feature in H5P, in our instance of H5P, we try to understand first uh, um, how academics can use, how can they benefit from that. Um, and um, so before rolling it out for the whole university, um, we went through a bit of like a um, some uh, agile methodology to understand the needs and uh, make sure that we tailor uh, the resources that we're going to produce once we 
um, disseminate that feature for faculties actually respond to their needs. So um, the work that around open education practices that we've uh, already built um, uh, outside the technology, uh, we have used it in that technology. So make use of the open education knowledge that we have built across other platforms into the dissemination of tools and technologies that support open educational resources. So this is like one of the things that we to try to bridge the gap or uh, create as um, Adrian said, creating links between um, different words. The really great tips there. Um, meet, meet them, meet, meet our users where they are, I suppose is the, the key there. Um, the questions are rolling in now. So um, it's no longer just whatever I wanna know, unfortunately. I'll. Uh, uh, let's let's get it. Oh, there's one that has uh, quite a lot of upvotes. So um, jump in for whoever feels uh, their best place to to speak to this. What role for government here? So far, we have not had much effective progression of open access um, to research that isn't simply um, toting up to big publishing. <laughs> uh, so, uh, does anyone? I, and obviously, Australia. There's also New Zealand, um, a lot of the people who come to OAA things, but um, it would also be interesting to to know about the US state as well. So I don't know, if, Elena, if you want to start with how things are going for government there and, and maybe we can see um, and we get a local view soon. Apart from uh, lawsuits, lawsuits have really been the motivating factor here, I feel. We do have the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, which is largely what these lawsuits rely on to argue for making things accessible in an educational context. So, But so far, I, I don't know that that has affected our big publishers much besides what we're advocating ourselves. Does anyone have a view on the Australian situation. Um, I'm sure we could all think about what role we'd like the government to have. I might jump in here and then, you know, hopefully others will will as well. I, I'm somewhat torn um, with, with, with the role of government because on, on one side, uh, having a national priority toward open could signal you know support it could also signal that that this is something that is actually important and that we should invest in and often policy at a university um, and strategy they really talk about where we're going to put our resources uh, so if something becomes a strategic priority it attracts resources and that's really what we're lacking at the moment is uh, especially uh, any sort of grant funding at the national level. And I mean, Call has very admirably stepped into that area with the collective and they've been able to offer, but they are a limited resource. Uh, we, we realistically need to be doing a lot more. Um, but I think we can also look at Call as an exemplar of an organization that is doing the best that they possibly can with the resources that they have. Um, and so they, they're, they're a good example for, for others to follow. The other side of it, however, is that I'm a strong believer in communities coming together and becoming self-governed. And the idea, I, I, I'm very influenced, um, and if any of you are interested in following it up, um, there's uh, work done by uh, Eleanor Ostrom, around how um, open communities actually govern themselves around predominantly open natural resources. And I think that there's a huge role for communities to actually get together, become more self-governed, and also then in, it basically engage in activism and, and also lobbying in a manner that they can actually change the reality from the ground up. And the reason why I think that lobbying is very important is that open, unlike commercial publishers, we don't have salespeople. We don't have a marketing budget. We don't have that kind of money where we can actually go and take academics out for coffee and talk, talk about the latest open textbooks. The, the commercialized publishers certainly do. We don't really have anything which can actually stand in the same place. 
And so I feel that on one hand, having government intervention in order to kind of safeguard the social good, if you were, and to also perhaps curb what is going on and encourage a better system. This is a good thing. But I'm also thinking that a self-governed community that comes together creates a ground swell and then actually shows that we've got viable models that can replace the existing reality and basically use that as your momentum to steamroll over older obsolete structures. So following on from that, there's a there's another question around um, librarians having community of practices around these topics. Uh, the question is, do you know of similar spaces for academics um, and the possibilities around merging these, collaborating? And I suppose there's also a, a question for, again, the, the collaboration between the research and the, the OER side as well. So a couple of different ways to try and merge communities. So that was to Adrian, a follow on. Sorry, I was going to flick that to somebody else. Um, in well, terms... yeah, that's true. Ash is also very heavily involved in Yes, in very much so. And I also look at the work that Mace does um, when, when you were talking about third space practitioners um, and bringing people um, into the community by meeting them where they were at. Um, I suppose, can, can I flick that to you, Mace, um, to talk about your work in that area? Sure. Um, and um, the, the communities of practices actually and, and creating communities, I like really what you said earlier. So I was trying to take some notes, but um, it's, yeah, it's that power in the community and bringing people together. There's um, one one recent work that we have done and in, in that, it was an open textbook. It was about learning design. It was about inclusive learning design and um, diversity in learning design. Um, the group of people that we brought together in 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 this work uh, is actually interesting. They're from ev almost everywhere, professional staff, academic staff, researchers, cross-institutional, um, and many of them actually academics, which was great. This is like the this struggle, I think, for, for all of us here is just engaging academics because they're very busy with teaching, governance, uh, administrative work, uh, marking, just the biggest one. So well, we acknowledge that it is a big challenge and having them joining the, the conversation is actually a big win because uh, it's not only about the uh, the discipline knowledge that they provide, but also about the teaching practices, which they don't often talk about. Conferences they go to is often for um, uh, discipline conferences, their do domain knowledge, but conferences are around learning and teaching. You'll see very few academics there, um, but they exist, of course. There are so many of them, and engaging them with us in some some platforms um, and creating. Uh, Creating community of practice is just like one of the hardest missions, really. I have to, to say that. It needs a really, really good dedication. And I know at Cole and at um, uh, so Council of Australian Universities and librarians and uh, the uh, Ascalite Open Education Practices SIG, they're actually excellent communities that not only I had the privilege to be part of, but also to bring more people or talk about this communities at my institution and kind of demonstrate how uh, we can um, uh, work across institutions uh, in creating these communities communities of practice. But yes, there are leaders, there are people who are leading, and you've got two wonderful people here in, on the panel, Adrienne and Ash, leading these communities. Uh, thank you, Mace. And there is a follow-up question for Elena around um, what uh, the community of practices are like in the States around kind of open there's a lot more local and regional groups, I would say, depending on where you are and what the interest is. There are some um, wider networks. There's one, I think it's more international, the Rebus community out of Canada that we've participated in before. Um, and there's some out of the University of Minnesota, which has a, which is a big producer of open textbooks. Um, some of those local areas have had really good community practice, um, but it really is sort of, I feel, um, 
and then through our, our library organizations and other organizations, but it seems there's not as big of a, a, a national movement as maybe I would like, but. Um, yes, I guess uh, United States, much, much bigger, <laughs> a lot, lot more opportunities to uh, focus more in the states and the regions. Um, so the, the, the questions are coming in fast now. Um, Ash, I might throw to you for this one. Uh, is there a push for accessibility in terms of language, e.g. using more accessible terminology to increase understanding of research or education beyond um, a primary academic audience? I mean, I've definitely heard about it in some places. So people are using things like Hemingway to, um, that's a tool where you can input text and, um, you know, helps you figure out the reading level. And, you know, if this is um, kind of overblown and you need to kind of pair it back. Um, um, but I, I don't know if it's, if there's necessarily a big push for this. I don't know if anyone else can speak to that. Um, I mean, I certainly, whenever I talk about scholarly language, I usually use scholarly language because what is scholarly language? Um, so, I, I, yeah, I would say Hemingway is really the only thing that I've really heard about in that regard. Um, I hear a lot in open about um, how OER are primarily published in English and we need to do more to publish in other languages. Um, and you can see some really cool um, projects that are that are um, funding translation projects, because it's obviously not as simple as going to Google Translate, there's nuance. Um, and uh, and also translating or translating, transforming OER into different formats and making them audio books as well and things like that. Um, but uh, yeah, with regard to research language, um, I haven't really heard a whole lot. I don't know if anyone else on the panel has. If you remember last year when I was chairing another session, there was a, a Pacific journal that just focused on, on translating research articles to various languages from the Pacific to make, make that research more accessible. I remember that was something I um, took away from that session about you know, how much we take for granted that so much of um, our research is in English and also our textbooks. Um, okay, I must, uh, we're at one twenty, so I reckon we've got around five minutes to go for questions, so I'll have to keep on my toes. Um, so there's a question here, evaluating OER as teaching interventions can produce scholarship of learning and teaching outputs as open access research. How can we frame this so it isn't more work? Um, does anyone want to to take that question on? Does anyone need any clarification of the question? Um, has anyone been involved in many evaluation projects around OERs or the impact of certain OERs? A few. Um, and so, but I saw Mace, you would, you were just, um, uh, unmuting. So do you want to start off and then I'll build on that? Uh, sure. I'll just share personal experience and the work that I've done with, um, Eseta Tololale from University of Southern Queensland. Um, Eseta and I, we've done, um, a kind of a comparative, case studies research, we talked about how we evaluated our open educational resources, which we engaged our students in producing. And uh, what, uh, of course, I'm not going to summarize the findings here, but the, the interesting thing that we found is that um, there, is a, there is a lot contributing to the quality of the outcome when once we integrate open education pedagogy or we adopt open education pedagogy and here in Isidus and my example we talk about renewable assessments um, there's a lot that contributes to the quality of the final outcomes we both used um, a quality evaluation frameworks to assess the work of our students um, and uh, examples of how these uh, OERs or open education practices that students produced continue to be used and they're still alive and in, in practice. So um, this is this is one of the things, but again, as a research work, it requires a bit of time and dedication, which I'm not sure all academics will, will have time to do that. But 
I think the outcomes from these studies is that we can rely on that methodology or that evaluation uh, rubric that we have used and take that and embed it into actual subjects. And this is something that I've done. So when I've done my research, I've also worked with a subject coordinator who used that rubric that I've developed and put it into their subject. So they started actually marking, doing the same thing based on, on that um, outcome from that research. So this is like one way, one example of um, how we did it. Um, just, yeah, sorry, I'm just uh, floored by how how much how much work you you've undertaken at UTS and so many practical outcomes that that other institutions can can really build upon. Uh, Adrian, did you want to to follow up with your previous thought? Yes. Um. So within the um within the uh, grant program um, that I administered, one of the things that we changed very early on was um, changing from a final report um, to a journal article. And so what we did was we said that over the 18 months of the grant cycle, that um, staff would consider how they were going to evaluate from the very beginning, um, where they might target in terms of their journal choices. Uh, and they had to produce a draft journal article as the final um, output alongside their open educational resource or practice. Uh, we did find that that people um, really engaged with that because they said, um, and, and kind of one of the things that, that I always put forward is that if you're going to do one lot of work, you should get at least three outcomes from it. Um, and that's the that's the not doing more work. So if you um, successfully get a grant, that always looks good on your resume. If you um, implement something where you get an open textbook, open assessment, um, which in, improves your learning and teaching uh, overall and your student feedback, that's your second. And then if we require you to do a journal article as well, there's your third output. So you're doing one lot of work, getting those three outputs. And we also um, had a lot of conversations around how they might then position things like their scholarship of learning and teaching, plus the teaching practice itself in, um, say, promotions documentation. And we have had a number of staff who have been successfully promoted uh, on the back of their open education work. So once you start to, I, I, I think it is more work. There's no two ways about it. Um, if, if you're going to say, well, engage in research as well, that's automatically additional work. But I think it's selling the benefits where you can say, well, you, you, you're doing this work. You may as well get an extra outcome. You may as well get something that you can use for promotions rounds. You may as well get an output where you can take our small institutional grant and maybe work it into an external grant. Um, and so I think that that foreshadowing that there's a longer road that you can walk is definitely um, of advantage. A great uh, sales message to take uh, out to institutions, uh, if we all put our marketing hats on. Um, I am sorry to say that we're out of time. Um, I want to thank our panelists so much um, for their amazing presentations and their, their really great insights um, into both the topic and just the, the broader context that we that we all work in. Um, I definitely want to give an, an extra thank you to Elena and Teresa for joining us at what is probably a, a difficult time, I imagine, um, not having done the conversion. Um, but we really appreciate that. It's great to, to have a, a, a different perspective um, around what's happening elsewhere on the globe. Um, now, I do want to uh, promote our other Open Access Week sessions that are coming up. We have two more sessions this week, uh, as you can see on the screen now, uh, Communities in Action, Cutting Through Rough with Diamond Journals and Open Knowledge and Communities Contextualized, How Can Technology Support Communities and Their Decision Around Opening Their Knowledges. Um, so they are bound to be just as interesting as our session today. So please join them if you can, but remember they are all recorded and will be available online. Um, if this topic is a real passion point for you, um, I will also give a special mention that on Friday afternoon, Deakin University is hosting a session beyond OER, Open Educational Practices and Equity for All. So you can continue diving into this topic. Um, 
I also want to thank because uh, our presenters do not just magically appear uh, in this webinar. I want to thank the uh, amazing work of Elizabeth and Lyndall who organized and managed the session today. Uh, it takes lots of hours to come up with um, the topic and the speakers and um, I really want to thank you for that hard work. Um, another thank you to Natalie Pierce from La Trobe who was also assisting uh, in the initial organizing of the session. Uh, I now believe I'm going to hand over to Lyndall for the final close, but once again, thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for joining us today, by the way. Uh, here, I'm going to close with the closing karakia. So, kia tau, kia tato katoa, ti ao, mate mar marotau, ti hai mariora. Thanks. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful open access week. Thank you.